Tonight, Baltimore's daunting, complicated, and costly bridge cleanup. This crane that we're looking at is massive. So is the challenge ahead of us. How to remove debris from that collapsed bridge, the dangerous underwater salvage operation. An Alberta man alone in the cold, injured, and unable to call for help until his dog took action. They say it's Matt's best friend for a reason. The incredible story of how Hero saved his owner. This ain't Texas. Ain't no holding. Beyonce drops a new album and pushes the boundaries of country music. People of all sorts of diverse backgrounds and uh, that were coming out of the woodwork, like, hey, how come I haven't heard? Wow, I love this. Could it mean a renaissance for other black country artists? From CBC News, this is The National with Ian Hennemansing. And we begin tonight with the difficult and dangerous cleanup efforts now underway in Baltimore, three days after the dramatic collapse of the Francis Scott Key Bridge. One of the largest cranes in the country has arrived in the city, part of the extensive and expensive effort to clear tons of wreckage from the channel. This is an essential step that must happen before the bodies of four workers can be retrieved by divers and a vital shipping corridor can reopen. Richard Madden has more on the challenges that lie ahead. The first of several giant salvage cranes arrived at the wreckage site to start the monumental task of clearing tons of twisted metal from the collapsed Francis Scott Key Bridge. This crane that we're looking at is massive. The thing we also know is this. So is the challenge ahead of us. One of the cranes can lift a thousand tons, but the remains of the bridge weighs four times that, and the sheer amount of debris to scoop up is enormous. That's why officials have ordered more powerful reinforcements to help speed up recovery efforts and eventually reopen the vital port of Baltimore, one of the busiest in America. Seven floating cranes, 10 tugs, nine barges, eight salvage vessels, and five Coast Guard boats. Soon, crews on the ground and dive teams under the dark, choppy water will use cutting torches, chopping up the bridge piece by piece to be lifted by the mammoth cranes above. We're basically talking about a ship the size of the Eiffel Tower with a bridge on top of it, debris in 50-foot water, currents, uh, wind, power lines nearby. Uh, this is a very difficult, involved situation. Crews are also hoping to recover the remains of the missing construction workers who were on the bridge on the night of the tragedy. They plunged into the water after that cargo ship crashed into it. A vigil was held for them nearby. We all, we all love you. Officials won't give a timeline, but outside engineers say it'll take months to clean up the mess, billions more for a new bridge. President Joe Biden says he'll visit Baltimore next week. Cargo ships have since been rerouted to other ports on the eastern seaboard, affecting supply chains across the U.S. Richard Madden, CBC News, Washington. In a sign of Haiti's worsening violence and chaos, the country's most powerful gangster is now pitching himself as part of the solution. Ithla Musa has the latest on the crisis there and the handful of Canadians able to escape it. A helicopter lands at Canada's embassy in Port-au-Prince. After weeks of fear, 50 Canadians were evacuated, flown to the Dominican Republic on Thursday to escape widespread gang violence ravaging Haiti. France also helped desperate citizens leave earlier this week. We really felt under increasing threat, says this French citizen. We are really very grateful. The UN says more than 1,500 people were killed in gang violence so far this year, and more than 800 have been injured. The situation in Haiti is cataclysmic. Gangs continued to use sexual violence to brutalize, punish, and control people. The rape of kidnapped hostages continues to be used to coerce families into paying ransoms. Children continue to be recruited and abused. The UN now says Haiti needs up to 5,000 international police to get the violence under control. Kenya has offered police to lead a force, but not until the country has clear leadership. The head of one of Haiti's most powerful gangs now controlling the streets, Jimmy Cherizier, also known as Barbecue, told Sky News he's open to talks on the country's political future as long as Haitians are at the table. But he warned there will be more bloodshed if foreign forces are deployed. 
Already, people displaced by the conflict are crowding this makeshift medical center, looking for help as the country's health care system teeters on the verge of collapse. Some of them are injured, says this doctor. Many of them are children suffering from malnutrition. And in this situation, we're going to end up with a food crisis, a crisis that only continues to deepen. Idil Moussa, CBC News, Toronto. Israeli airstrikes continue to pound Gaza, including in the north, where new video shows the dramatic rescue of a boy from the rubble. <laughs> The Israeli strikes come amid continued warnings of famine in Gaza. Yesterday, the UN's top court ordered Israel to allow more food and medical aid in and to open more land crossings. Israel denies blocking humanitarian aid supplies. The Hamas-run health ministry says more than 32,000 people have been killed in Gaza since the war began. And Israel's military has released this video of an airstrike in southern Lebanon. It says it killed a senior Hezbollah commander who coordinated rocket attacks against northern Israel. Syrian officials also accuse Israel of airstrikes in Aleppo, reportedly killing at least 38 people. Back here in Canada, a dramatic story of survival in rural Alberta. A man in his 60s fortunate to be alive after spending two days stuck in the mud in freezing temperatures. As Julie Wong explains, his only protection was his dog, whose loyalty played a crucial role in his rescue. Okay, this is the direction the dog was running towards me. A peaceful run with his dog Thursday morning turned into something else entirely for Curtis Dow. This dog came right up on him and grabbed him by the throat. I struggled with the dog for about 10 minutes trying to get him off my dog. The tussle left both Dow and his dog Jack nursing some wounds. He went back here, to the outskirts of town, to find the other dog and call police. Constable Austin Weersink was the first on scene. After I whistled, I heard a, a loud scream for help. So I was a little taken back with where this may have came from. Um, so I whistled again, and the shriek came again and said, help, I'm down here. Hey, this is the area where the, the police department found, found this gentleman. A 61-year-old man who police say had been stranded for two days, alone, injured and unable to move, with temperatures plunging as low as minus 17 degrees. He was behind this very, like, five-foot-tall um, bush of just grass and weeds and kind of laying on his back, um, and he was unable to get up. He was quite cold. He was shivering. Protecting him the whole time, the man's dog, who stayed with him, even fighting off coyotes, police say. For a dog to be in this situation and act the way it did and alert us and other people to the location of its owner, um, to, if it could speak, just to say thanks so much and um, how much we appreciate what it did. You know, they, they say it's man's best friend for a reason. And the dog, if you can believe it, is named Hero. Staff at the animal shelter now caring for him say he lived up to his name. And I think it's just a testament to how loyal dogs are to their owners. As for Dal, all is forgiven with the dog's aggression. Yeah, I'm glad I went back out there. Proving that when it comes to man's best friend, everyone needs a hero. Julia Wong, CBC News, Edmonton. In B.C., rescue efforts are underway to try to save an orphaned orca calf. Teams of experts are working to help free the young whale whose mother became beached in a lagoon and died. But as Yvette Bren shows us, the clock is ticking. An orca calf, not quite two years old, circles the waters of an inlet off the coast of Vancouver Island, trapped and alone. This calf has weeks uh, to live if it's not uh, getting any nutrients. So we know that our time is, our timeline is short. Last weekend, the calf followed her pregnant mother into a remote inlet here. The mother was hunting seal, but became trapped in a narrow, shallow lagoon. It's a huge shame, but it, it is the risk and the gamble that these animals play with that kind of very near-shore technique of sort of corralling an animal into the shallows. Community and First Nations members tried to save the mother, but she died. Oh, poor girl. That's so sad. Attention quickly turned to the calf, which they've named Brave Little Hunter or Quisaheus. 
Ten vessels worked to save the calf Thursday. Scientists used whale recordings in a device that bangs metal pipes to urge it out to sea. Playbacks have been very effective about moving the animal within the lagoon, just not out of the lagoon. So far, the still nursing calf seems healthy, but it needs food. A last ditch effort may involve using a sling to hoist the calf past the shallows, back to the open waters where the tight knit teapod can hear her call. I'm optimistic just based on the fact that it often literally takes a village to raise some of these calves, and the whale will have strong bonds with other family members if it can find them. Locals say they've seen the calf eating birds, so brave little Hunter hopefully still has a chance. Yvette Brand, CBC News, Vancouver. And there are calls for Canada to step up protections for the endangered North Atlantic right whale as birth rates drop. Environmental group Oceana Canada says at least 25 births should have been recorded this season, but so far it's only logged 19 and already three of them are believed to have died. It wants the government to expand current measures to protect the whales from ship strikes and getting tangled in fishing gear. You figures show Ottawa is falling short of its goal to make affordable daycare available for all families who need it by 2026. Yesterday, the Prime Minister announced plans to expand the program, but as Jamie Strachan tells us, some advocates say it is not enough. I wanted to continue my career. For Toronto parent Kristen Lilliman, the prospect of cheaper daycare was a game changer. I think many families were just so happy for that relief. Like going from 1400 to 700 or whatever it may be, it's huge. Um, that's a pretty life-changing difference in a monthly payment. When her son was around 12 months old, she wanted to return to work. And paying huge fees was an unfortunate part of that plan. It's substantial and uh, you just kind of grit and bear it until daycare, the daycare phase is over and the kids in school. Since Ontario opted into the federal $10 a day childcare program, fees across the province have plummeted. Not to $10 a day, but much less than what parents used to pay. Most child cares have opted into the program, but there's been issues. So we've seen the wait lists, you know, get longer and longer. There's lots of families that may have wanted to get a child care space, never bothered to put their name on a wait list because they knew they wouldn't be able to afford it. Well, now that they hear that they might be able to afford it, they're going to get their name on those wait lists. A lack of child care spaces and long wait lists, a problem in other provinces too. In 2021, Ottawa vowed to create 250,000 spots nationwide with an average $10 a day cost. So far, only about 40% of those spaces have materialized. Experts say both federal and provincial governments haven't yet figured out how to create more space. In childcare, the responsibility of building and creating spaces has been and continues to a large extent be put, is put on uh, the shoulders and backs of individuals, not-for-profit organizations, and some uh, entrepreneurs. So while costs are down until more childcare spaces are created, actually getting a spot is a bit like winning the lottery, at least for now. Jamie Strachan, CBC News, Toronto. A dramatic void on the front page of the Wall Street Journal today, the blank space marking a painful anniversary. One year ago, Russia detained reporter Evan Gershkovich, accusing him of espionage. It's been a year of agony for his family, who say he's being held hostage. And as Briar Stewart tells us, he's not the only American journalist Moscow has jailed. Evan! It's been one year since U.S. journalist Evan Gershkovich was arrested. Russia accuses him of being a spy. The U.S. government believes he's being held as a bargaining chip. The accusations against Evan are categorically untrue. The U.S. considers Gershkovich wrongfully detained. Media reports have suggested that he's part of a prisoner swap negotiation. One that could have also included imprisoned opposition leader Alexei Navalny, who later died under suspicious circumstances in prison. Great reporter is sitting in prison. A number of Western journalists. Danielle Gershkovich says it can be hard to follow her brother's case on the news. It can be just up and down, up and down emotionally. So it's just best to um, just continue to stay focused on this eventual goal. But Gershkovich isn't the only U.S. journalist in Russian prison. Uh, 
Alsu Krumasheva was arrested in October after returning there to visit her elderly mother. Krumasheva is a dual national of Russia and the U.S. and works for Radio Free Europe. The book is called Saying No to War. Krumasheva co-edited this book about the war in Ukraine. Her husband, Pavel Butorin, says she was charged with failing to register as a foreign agent and for spreading disinformation. Regardless of any charges, we know that Alsu is being held hostage because she is an American. That's really the, the main reason why she is now in detention. Butorin wants Washington to declare her wrongfully detained. Every morning when I wake up, uh, I think, am I doing enough for Alsu's release? Am I speaking enough about her? Unless the U.S. pushes harder for her release, he fears that under Russia's increasingly repressive laws, she could spend years in prison. Breyer Stewart, CBC News, London. And U.S. President Joe Biden responding today in a statement, journalism is not a crime, adding, we will continue to denounce and impose costs for Russia's appalling attempts to use Americans as bargaining chips. Pope Francis made history when he exclusively washed the feet of women during a Holy Thursday ritual. The Pope kissing and cleaning the feet of 12 inmates inside a prison on the outskirts of Rome. The ceremony meant to emphasize serving others and humility. Hollywood has lost a trailblazing actor who broke barriers in a career spanning seven decades. I had to relearn the importance of what it takes to survive in this town. The life and legacy of Louis Gossett Jr. next. Plus a new Beyonce album with a very different sound. What her move in country means for other black artists. And later serving up suds with a whole lot of spirit. It's not a sin to drink a beer. The nuns pulling pints in a bar of their own. We're back in two. New video showing the devastation across northeast Madagascar. After a tropical cyclone tore across the island nation this week, at least 18 people have been killed. Several others have been reported missing. The storm packing winds of at least 150 kilometers an hour with heavy rains that led to widespread flooding. Veteran actor Louis Gossett Jr. has died at the age of 87, a trailblazing performer whose career spanned seven decades and included a historic Academy Award. Nisha Patel looks at his life and his work. The winner is Louis, Louis Gossett, Gossett Jr. He made history in 1983, the first black man to win the Oscar for Best Supporting Actor. It was for his performance in An Officer and a Gentleman. We're not talking about flying, we're talking about character. Louis Gossett Jr. was born in 1936 to working-class parents in Brooklyn. He made his Broadway debut in high school and made his Hollywood premiere in A Raisin in the Sun alongside Sidney Poitier, who would later become the first black man to win a Best Actor Oscar. But his big break came in 1977. He don't speak the Kang's English, Fiddler. His portrayal of Fiddler in the TV miniseries Roots won him an Emmy. Despite his successes, offers for leading roles eluded him, and he had some tough years. I had to relearn the importance of what it takes to, to, uh, to survive in this town, and I had to act as if I was second class. Still, Gossett was a trailblazer, and Hollywood paid tribute. A personal hero, wrote Wendell Pierce. Jennifer Hudson posted, thank you for paving the way. You can't survive without... Off-screen, Gossett focused on social justice, founding an organization committed to ending racism. In recent years, he earned a new generation of fans in hit series like The Watchmen and The Book of Negroes, filmed in Canada. The people in Nova Scotia are very nice and they smile a lot. Back then, he told CBC's Q how he wished to be remembered. I hope uh, I didn't hurt anybody, didn't leave any negative damage on society. Hopefully, I'll be considered as something positive and to help change people's lives for the better. Nisha Patel, CBC News, Toronto. One of the most anticipated albums of the year is out today with a move into a new genre for Beyonce. 
This ain't Texas. Ain't no hold em. What it means for other black artists in country music. Plus, the carbon tax is increasing, and so is the political rhetoric around it. How much are you really paying? Can you get more money back, and is it even really helping the environment? David Thurton looks for answers to the questions on the minds of Canadians. And a once famous vacation hotspot, now a toxic landscape of decay. Could potentially make the U.S. completely self-sufficient. How the world's largest lithium deposit could breathe new life into the Salton Sea. The National breaks down stories shaping our world. Next. Well, it's been five years in the making. Beyonce has released her highly anticipated new album, Cowboy Carter. It spans genres, but had a strong country influence. She calls it the best music she's ever made. Two songs from the album have already been topping charts, including the country music chart. That is a first for a black woman. As Magda Gebersalasa shows us, her new country sound is helping boost other black artists, including here in Canada. Beyonce is taking the reins, dropping act two of her renaissance trilogy, Cowboy Carter. This ain't Texas. With this single, she already made history, the first black woman to top Billboard's Hot Country Songs chart. Oh, I just since then, other black artists in the genre are seeing a spike in interest too. My reel went to 100,000 something, you know, views. Pretty Canadian Sasha has been following her country music dreams for years. Now, after she was mentioned in an article about Beyonce, new fans are finding their way to her. People of all sorts of diverse backgrounds and uh, that were coming out of the woodwork, like, hey, how come I haven't heard, wow, I love this. A wave of positivity that for Beyonce started with pushback. She expressed she felt unwelcome in the genre before, likely linked to the response she got performing at the CMA Awards. This album taps into country and blends in other genres too. There's a cover of the country classic Jolene, also featured Linda Martell, the first black woman to play solo at the Grand Ole Opry. I think it's a thrilling moment. Country music songwriter Alice Randall has written about black country's past, present and future. One of the things I wanted to see before I retired was a black woman at the top of the country charts. While there are a number of black country artists making their mark, Darius Rucker, Kane Brown, and Jimmy Allen get most of the play, says this researcher. 1.2% of the airplay for black artists is 95% for those three artists. 16 getting play is one thing, but first, getting classified as country. And I understand for some artists, including her, she's kind of saying, like, genre shouldn't matter. And for me, it is something that's important. Magda Gebrecelasa, CBC News, Toronto. Time now to break down the news shaping our world. Once an American paradise. The new recreational capital of the world. Now a toxic wasteland bubbling with lithium. They could produce probably about 4 million electric vehicle batteries a year. Can it revive the Salton Sea? But first. Carbon pricing is a key pillar of our emissions reduction strategies. That price is rising. We break down who pays and who wins. I pay about half of what I get back in the rebate. About 80% of households are better off. And the jobs hit hardest. The facts about the carbon tax. David Thurton cuts through the rhetoric to show us how the federal tax works and what the April 1st increase will mean. This carbon tax has got to go, and I'm gonna explain why. The carbon tax isn't the issue. The issue is competition. If they collect a little bit more tax than us Canadians and make us all broke, we're gonna be able to save the planet from burning up. There's a lot of talk about the carbon tax right now and between the political jabs and social media rants, it can be hard to get a handle on what this really means for you. Like, how much are you really paying? Can you get more money back? And is it even really helping the environment? Let's get into it. First up, not everyone pays the federal carbon tax and not everyone gets rebates. British Columbia, the three territories, and Quebec do have some form of carbon pricing. But if you live there, you don't get the federal rebate. 
if you live in the rest of Canada, you pay the federal carbon tax and you get a federal rebate. Businesses also pay the carbon tax. Big companies with big emissions may fall under a separate industrial carbon pricing system. Canada has had a national price on greenhouse gas emissions since 2019, and it goes up every year. It started at $20 per ton. On April 1st, it will reach $80, and it's slated to increase $15 a year until 2030, added to fuels that emit CO2 and other greenhouse gases when burned. Carbon pricing in Canada is a key pillar of our emissions reduction strategy. So this is Sarah Hastings-Simon. She's a professor at the University of Calgary. She studies how carbon pricing and other energy transitions can help Canada achieve its climate goals. The thinking behind carbon pricing, she says, is this. By putting a price on uh, carbon emissions, on greenhouse gas emissions, we make it more expensive to emit, more expensive to create uh, more carbon, and therefore we make it lower cost to, to use alternatives that create less carbon emissions. Not everyone can afford to go green, so let's do the math on what the rising price means. At the pump on April 1st, you'll pay about three cents extra per liter. That's on top of the carbon tax you already are paying. For the average driver, your total carbon tax bill for a full tank of gas will be from eight to $11. But as the carbon tax rises, so do rebates. He also as part of carbon pricing is what's done with the money that's collected. All of that money, uh, when it comes to federal carbon pricing, is returned to individuals and families within the province uh, that it's collected from. Maybe the most confusing thing about the carbon tax is the money some get back. Do you know whether or not you got the carbon tax rebate? I believe I did, but I'm not sure. Do you have questions about the carbon tax? Like, do you understand it fully? Uh, I'm not sure about it right now. You're a resident of Ontario, right? Yeah, yeah so you live here in Ottawa. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you're not sure if you got the rebate? No, no. Those rebates are now called the Canada Carbon Rebate. The term rebate is a bit misleading because you get the money up front before paying the carbon tax. This is the government's attempt to make sure low-income earners are not out of pocket. How much you receive depends on your family size and where you live. For example, a family of four in Alberta receives $450 every three months. Rural residents could soon receive a 20% top-up. That's because they tend to drive more and use more energy than people who live in a city. The question some have, do you pay more than you get back? I did my own calculations. I pay about half of what I get back in the rebate. So you're making money? Yeah, so for me... That's Andrew Leach, an economics professor at the University of Alberta. He wrote about his family's rebate on his substack. Turns out he's making a profit. What about others? Do we get back more money in the form of rebates than we pay in the form of a carbon tax? If you were you know, driving a high emissions vehicle, driving more than the average Canadian, living in a larger than average house, traveling more than average, then you're in those groups that are not getting as much back as they're paying. To better understand the original analysis, let's bring in Parliamentary Budget Officer Yves Giroux. The independent budget watchdog also looked at this. He told CBC's Power and Politics, the rich tend to lose money with the carbon tax, lower and middle income families make money. If you take into consideration the carbon tax that households pay on their fossil fuels that they're buying, gasoline, natural gas, diesel, mm -hmm. uh, so they pay that directly and they subtract from that the, the rebate, then about 80% of households are better off. That's one way of looking at it. Examine the broader impact on the economy and a different view emerges, a negative one according to the parliamentary budget officer. His economic analysis shows the carbon tax reduces jobs and revenues from the transport and oil and gas sectors. Lower employment, lower profits, lower dividends for those who own stocks. Meaning workers in the oil patch could lose their jobs and Canadians who hold shares in oil companies like Suncor or Synovus could see lower investment returns. So is the carbon tax even working? The answer is complex. Is carbon pricing working to reduce emissions? You know, it's a tricky question in terms of it's very hard. 
in a in a causal way to say I'm going to point to you know this specific thing that happened and it happened because of carbon pricing. Environment and Climate Change Canada says its modeling does show that our emissions would be higher without carbon pricing. And we also know that there is a cost to not acting on climate change, which the science says means more deadly heat domes, more intense wildfires and floods. And as David Thurton mentioned, eligible Canadians get their rebates in installments. The first payment typically coming six to eight weeks after the government proce processes your tax return. Coming up in the desert in Southern California, a green energy source still untapped. Enough lithium um, to manufacture about half a million electric vehicles per year. How lithium could revive the Salton Sea. That's next on The Breakdown. Salt and sea, a dream that dried up, leaving behind poison pools and toxic dust. I wanted to live at the beach, and it was like living at the beach. It was awesome here. Under the ruins, they found riches. It was a very significant amount of lithium that could really help make the U.S. very self-sufficient. But a green gold rush may not be enough to bring this place back. Jean-Francois Belanger takes us to this extraordinary Southern California lake. Its devastation its promise, and the community desperate to avoid getting left behind. The potential reserves here are pretty spectacular, actually. It's a very significant amount of lithium that could ha really help make the U.S. very self-sufficient. In terms of overall footprint, uh, environmental footprint, you really can't get better than, than this resource coupled with the technology that we have. Wherever there's mining, it leaves a legacy of destruction behind, legacy of contamination. It's our minerals. The minerals are in public lands. At first glance, a majestic landscape, an enormous inland sea, the largest in California, often dubbed the miracle in the desert. The Salton Sea, Portsman's Paradise the new recreational capital of the world. The Salton Sea used to be a favorite vacation hotspot for Hollywood stars back in the 50s and 60s. Frank Sinatra, Jerry Lewis, and the Marx Brothers were among the regulars, the Beach Boys as well. Beauty and fun in all its phases. But the Salton Sea is also a cursed lake. It was formed in 1905 after an accidental flooding and later became the site of multiple environmental disasters. Over the past decades, drought led one third of the water to evaporate, exposing 100 square kilometers of toxic dust from the dried lake bed. So the floating duck and the canal in front of Donna Winter's house now seem pointless. Now, yeah, now it's just dried up. And the water you see is from the rain, because that was all dry a couple weeks back, maybe a month. Dust and decay, a desolate landscape far removed from the paradise it once was. I wanted to live at the beach. That's why I bought here. And it was like living at the beach. It was awesome here. That time, the dock right there, the top of that, the kids were diving off, swimming, everything. The Salton Sea is now twice as salty as the ocean. It is also the most polluted lake in California, largely due to contamination from agricultural runoff. A series of abandoned resort towns now dot its shoreline. Bombay Beach is the most famous one. With its toxic waterfront and its surreal apocalyptic atmosphere, it has attracted and inspired many artists. But at the other end of the lake, a geological curiosity 
is raising hope. It's a lunar landscape. It is a very lunar landscape. Michael McKibben is a geologist, and he's passionate about this place. And this is what makes this area interesting. Yeah, I mean, this is a manifestation of uh, all the uh, hot magma that's probably down at five to seven kilometers. This and the volcanoes are the only surface manifestation of all, all the really amazing stuff that's going on at depth that we can't see. A dozen geothermal power stations are already tapping into this renewable energy source. But the lithium-rich hot brine deep beneath the surface is the real treasure here, one of the largest deposits in the world. But their current production capacity of brine, if they don't add any more plants, they could produce probably about 4 million electric vehicle batteries a year. If they ramp up the production like we think they will over the next decade or so, then you're talking about maybe 10 or 12 million electric vehicles per year. I think it's interesting because it could potentially make the U.S. completely self-sufficient. A new gold rush is now on the way in California. Three companies are racing to strike it rich, thanks to what they refer to as green lithium. There's a lot of good environmental reasons why we should do it here. The plumbing is already there, the power plants are all there, so why not just tack on a lithium filter and do it? So this is the geothermal power plant. David Deek is a former Tesla executive. He is confident that energy source minerals, the company he now works for, will become the first to extract lithium here two years from now, if all goes well. We'll produce about 20,000 tons of lithium hydroxide product. That's enough lithium um, to manufacture about half a million electric vehicles per year. What makes this lithium from the Salton Sea, what makes it so interesting? What makes it um, such a sort of sustainable resource is that you know, you're, not, you're not having to mine anything. The only sort of work that has to be done is to extract that lithium out of the brine before it gets re-injected. We vastly outperform any existing operation on all of those metrics, land footprint, water footprint, uh, and carbon footprint especially. The technology looks promising, but it's never been tested on a large scale. So the local population remains very cautiously optimistic, and many have concerns. Hey, hello, I'm Jean-Francois. How are you doing, Luis Olmedo? It's a pleasure to meet you. Luis Olmedo dedicated his life to defending and supporting the people from the Imperial Valley, a region many now call Lithium Valley. Right now, as, as it stands, is the community set to win? No, we're not. So we have to come to the table we have to negotiate the terms and conditions, and we have to bring in the muscle. Like many here, Luis wants to believe in the lithium boom. He bought electric vehicles and had charging stations installed. But he also wants to make sure that people here, among the poorest in the country, won't be left behind. We maintain and operate over 70 air monitors throughout the Imperial County. We're persistently breathing unhealthy air causing health impacts to our respiratory system. That's why we have the highest prevalence of asthma, especially among school-age children. Luis wants to ensure the extraction process is clean. He also says some of the profits should be used for decontamination. As a community, as a people who live here, we cannot afford any more pollution. We're already overburdened with pollution. For years, Luis has been taking the pulse of the people here. Today, he's visiting Hector Cervantes, an active member of the community. What do you expect? I mean, well, I mean jobs? It it'll be jobs, it'll be infrastructure jobs. Um, because right here, is, I mean, right here in the valley, the job, the job rates, it's, it's outrageous. We, we, they're homeless, there's a lot of homeless. There's, uh, people want jobs, but not at any cost. Okay, what are we going to get out of it? Are they just going to come make this another mine it out, do what they got to do, and then leave? Or are they going to help us out, stay here for the long run? We just trying to figure it out, you know? How can we put these communities in a position of advantage? If lithium holds its promise, the Salton Sea could well be on the cusp of a major revival and return to past glory while giving the country the keys to energy independence.
Analysts believe there's enough lithium at Salton Sea to replace every gas-powered car in the U.S. with an electric vehicle and then some. But getting it out is the challenge. The brine is extremely corrosive, eating through steel and concrete, and ramping up production could take years. Up next, the Catholic nuns who opened a bar. I think many people would think it's unusual because they've never seen it. But, you know, it's not a sin to drink a beer. The pious pints coming up in our moment. At a Sister Guadalupe from the Pilgrims of the Eucharist, she's pouring a cold pint of beer at the House of the Mother Bar, located in an ancient Catholic sanctuary in Spain. She's one of 18 nuns who recently opened the bar. It was previously run by Catholic monks until 2022. Now the sisters have taken over the, to spread the word of God in between pints of beer. And the bartending nuns are our moment. I think many people would think it's unusual because they've never seen it. But you know, it's not a sin to drink a beer. Especially here in Spain, it's more of a cultural thing. It's called Amarenechea, the house of the mother, like at, at home, like at mother's home. Pues me encanta porque es que las veo siempre tan alegres, con una sonrisa que me que me transmiten pues mucha paz y mucha alegría. Buen día, Vincent. Gracias a Dios desde que se abrió y sobre todo desde bueno el primer día, el segundo y ahora el fin de semana. Eh, desde las 10 de la mañana que se abre, eh, hay una fila hasta que sale del bar eh, con personas y un grupo y otro grupo y otro grupo y sin parar, ¿no? Entonces, pues también eso pues es nuevo, ¿no? Nos toca aprender a hacer las cosas y, muy y rápido. It's more of an open door for us to evangelize. Our producer Maria found some local articles that say that the nuns have breathed new life into that sanctuary. And by the way, it's not just beer. They serve vermouth and wine, also coffee and meals. And it is all an opportunity, as we heard Sister Guadalupe say just a moment ago, to, to spread the word of God. That is a national for March 29th. I hope you join me Sunday for Cross Country Checkup on CBC Radio and CBC News Network. And later that night, right here for the national. Have a great Saturday.